everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 21st of February, and if you're in the United States, uh, hopefully you've managed to keep warm, uh, especially in Texas like me. Uh, maybe you've been without power for a few days, but hopefully you got power back now and uh, no kind of damage or anyone injured or anything. Um, so new videos this week. I posted a two hour SC900 kind of study cram. So I took the beta of this exam and then I created this two hour kind of summary of what you need to know for the exam. Now luckily I recorded that actually on Sunday and then posted it Tuesday because Sunday night I lost power. And I didn't really have proper power <laughs> until Thursday. So I wasn't able to post a second video this week because I had no power, um, but for a little bit of fun, there's me actually out in zero degrees um, trying to thaw out parts of the swimming pool fountain system with a flamethrower because I was trying to stop it from actually all freezing up and stop flowing because then the pool would break. So a little bit of uh, excitement for me during the zero degree weather out there early hours. Um, so let's actually get to the new content and kind of as always if this is useful a like subscribe comment and share is appreciated So on the compute side um, The standard load balancer and standard IPs are now available um, Through that instance metadata service. This is that 169.254.169.254 endpoint you can go into within a virtual machine and find out information. If you've never seen it, it's actually pretty cool. And there's a number of different things you can actually do with this. Um, for example, I can actually go and find out are there maintenance activities. But what they've added is things about the standard load balancer, uh, inbound, outbound kind of rules that would impact me and the IP. So if I was to jump over to here, and I'll just super quick go to a virtual machine and connect to it, and we'll use the Azure Bastion service. So I will, again, that lets me from the portal actually go and to connect to services without me having to manually worry about endpoints uh, being available and all of that stuff. So if I just actually go and connect, oh, let's allow the pop-up over here. I'll try that again. So it's going to open that up in the browser. And then what I can do is you can just make a request to that metadata endpoint. So I've kind of got one prepared and ready here already. And if I just execute this, what you'll see is it gives me a whole bunch of information. I can see the tags about the virtual machine, information about the network, the VM size is kind of shown here. Um, all this different information, the images I used, really everything I'd want to know about the configuration at the Azure Resource Manager level of this actual virtual machine. I'm looking at this from within the virtual machine itself. So this metadata endpoint is actually super, super useful. And so what they've now done is they've gone ahead and added additional data uh, to that metadata endpoint. So we can now go and get that from within the guest OS itself. And there's now automatic VM extension upgrade. So this is limited today to just a couple of extensions. And um, this is really built around the dependency agent and the app health agent. But if you think about it, there's new versions of these agents are released. So if I turn on this functionality, what will now happen is when there's a new version of that agent available, it will just automatically upgrade that agent on VMs or VM scale sets, which are just VMs automatically managed. It follows the same kind of rules as a VM scale set um, automatic image update. It won't update more than 20% at a time. As it starts to roll out those updates, if it detects more than 20% of those upgraded go unhealthy, it's gonna stop um, that continuation. And it won't update paired regions at the same time. It will do one availability zone at a time and then kind of one update domain at a time. So it is going to roll this out in a very um, staged process. But now, uh, just for those two extensions today, but that's going to um, add more extensions over time. Um, Cross-region VM restore is now GA. So if you think about with Azure Backup, 
essentially what happens is it, it's really using kind of the recovery vault underneath. So I'm gonna think about, well, I have kind of my recovery vault, which really kind of sits on top of kind of Azure storage. And I have my primary region, then I can turn on kind of that geo replication where it replicates up into that kind of paired region. Now in the past to do kind of that restore, the Azure region, that primary would have to fail. Well, Azure Storage added the ability for a customer initiated failover. So I don't have to have Azure say, hey, the region's down. I can now as the customer for my GOS storage account say, hey, I want to fail over. Because Azure Storage has it, now Azure Backup lets you as the customer do a customer initiated failover of kind of your recovery vault. And then I can restore using that cross region replication. So that ability is now available for me to do that customer initiated failover and then cross region restore. Um, the DAV4 and the DAV the SAV4, the, the kind of Epic, AMD Epic processors are now available for HD Insights. So when I create my HD Insight clusters, obviously that's built on virtual machines. So now I can use those AMD Epic processors for my HD Insight cluster. On the networking side, two pretty big services have gone into preview. So the first is Azure Firewall Premium. And this is actually adding a, a bunch of features the first one is around TLS inspection. Now, if we think about ordinarily, um, if I'm kind of a client machine and I talk to some site and it's using kind of SSL, that TLS, well, it establishes kind of that, that TLS session. And there's no way for kind of something in between to inspect the traffic because that encrypted session is between those two endpoints. Well, what happens now with the Azure Firewall Premium, it actually, instead of going that path, it actually goes to here. And the Azure Firewall generates a certificate for that site uh, that will be trusted by the client. So it terminates that TLS session at the firewall, so then it can inspect the traffic and then re-encrypt it using the site's proper certificate and kind of send it on. So now I can use Azure Firewall Premium to actually inspect even encrypted traffic. So it's gonna kind of sit in the middle and enable that capability. And um, it also adds intrusion detection and prevention system, looking for certain bytes, certain sequences in the traffic uh, that would indicate an attack. And again, it can do that even for those encrypted um, sessions because now it can sit in the middle. And I kind of showed it going outbound. It can support inbound TLS inspection as well when it's partnered with App Gateway. Um, one of the other things this lets me do is we're used to the idea of inspecting fully qualified domain names. So I could say something like, well, www.savaltech.net. And what that really is, is the fully qualified domain name. And that's all we can ever see ordinarily if I'm looking at an encrypted session because the way it works is the client establishes a TCP session to the site, then a TLS session to the site. Again, that's just the name. And then once it has the TLS session, it sends the full URL. Remember, a URL is when I then have things like, well, that HTTPS and then path, uh, page, etc etc so that's kind of the url has a fully qualified domain name as part of it well now because firewall premium is actually um, doing that tls inspection it can actually now see the urls so it can now do things like uh, url filtering the categories that it supports whereas the regular standard just supports fully qualified domain name uh, based categories Premium can actually do URL-based categories, can look at things like the path, the pages I'm actually accessing. So this, this call kind of sitting in the middle, it, looking at the TLS traffic is opening up a lot of new things, and it can now do things like the URL inspection, URL filtering, so block things based on the URL, not just the fully qualified domain name, which is normally um, all you could see if I can't see inside that encrypted packet. 
And of course, that firewall is all going to be based on the new firewall policies that I can deploy directly, or I can use things like Azure Firewall Manager. And then um, Azure Front Door Standard and Premium have uh, gone into preview. So this is kind of like a, a V2 of Azure Front Door. Remember, the whole point of Azure Front Door is we can think about, hey, look, there's kind of this huge Azure backbone. There's all these kind of regions connected to that Azure backbone. But also, all around the world, there's kind of these edge points of presence. And what Azure Front Door did and still does is it uses something called Anycast, which means my service, that IP, is available on any of these points. It's available on any of them. So now if I'm a client, if I'm over here, well, I'm going to go to the one that's closest to me. And then it does something called Split TCP. So what Split TCP does is it actually terminates that user's session at that point. So the TCP, the, the TLS, is terminated there. That conversation happens close, so it's very, very quick. And then Front Door would go and fetch the traffic from whatever back end made the most sense in big chunks, and then served it up in little chunks and would cache it as well. So that's what Azure Front Door did and still does. But what they've now done is there's, that's great for like dynamic traffic. Then we'd have things like a content delivery network for more static, just hosting of stuff. And then things like the web application firewall to actually secure it, prevent kind of attacks on those various endpoints. So they've really bundled all three of those together, but also extended it so now I could have resources in other clouds, as long as it has kind of a public facing address, or even on premises, again, as long as it's public facing. And I put all of those uh, behind the front door. If I use premium, I can even use private link to expose maybe PaaS services into a VNet that aren't internet facing and make them available via Azure Front Door. And it's actually got, if I look at the preview, there's actually a nice kind of picture that really shows the differentiation between them. So as I was kind of explaining, it talks about the idea that, hey, look, there, there was this CDN thing. Um, there was kind of Azure Front Door, and there was Azure Web Application Firewall. They're all now kind of combined into this just Azure Front Door. And then you can see the difference between standard and premium. So premium adds things like threat intelligence, private link support, um, Web Application Firewall and bot protection, new types of attack signatures, security reporting. Um, but it gives you kind of a, a cool idea. So obviously this is preview. You can see and go down looking at the various um, capabilities between them. And so that's kind of uh, now available. You can go and create one of these and try it out in preview. But definitely kind of exciting stuff. Storage side, um, so actually a bunch of database things. I keep debating whether I should split storage into storage and databases, and I, I may do. So machine learning services, things like R and Python, traditionally would run on a separate server. And so when it wants to operate against the data, it would have to transport the data to where I'm running that machine learning. Maybe I'm running that machine learning to train a certain model. Maybe I'm using machine learning to prepare or clean data. Maybe it's just operational, I'm using machine learning. Well, I can now actually run those Python, those Rs, on my Azure SQL managed instance natively. Um, maybe those R Pythons are actually hooking in using T-SQL. Maybe I'm calling them from a store procedure. But now it's running on the server with the data, so that data doesn't have to go anywhere. So for all of those machine learning scenarios, it can just run. Uh, OK, a little OBS Studio error there. Weird. Uh, then we have SQL migration to SQL MI using Log Replay. So this is using the Log Replay service, LRS, and this is really for times where I can't use the preferred Azure Data Migration Service. Maybe I cannot install the DMS executable on my source server because of policy, or maybe I don't have permissions. Maybe I can't take the downtime associated. And so what this solution essentially does is I have my existing kind of SQL database. Now that SQL database can be anything from 2008 through to 2019. And I'm essentially taking the backups 
and I'm writing it to blob. So that would be a full initially, but then it could be uh, a different differential or a log backup. So then we get into kind of diffs and logs. And what happens is that is then basically replayed into my SQL managed instance. And this service will keep an eye on it. So as I put new logs, new backups into the blob, it will replay it into that SQL MI, essentially uh, keeping it up to date. And then when I'm ready, I kind of do a, a final copy and then flip it over. And I've now migrated my database over. So I have kind of that new option available for me. Uh, MySQL Flexible Server now has the option for additional IOPS. I think I've actually talked about this before. Um, but based on the size of the VM, I can purchase additional IOPS of performance for that MySQL Flexible Server. And then there's now new disk bursting metrics. So if you remember, uh, a premium managed disk, uh, SSD, if it's a P20 or smaller, it can actually burst to a higher amount of IOPS. I basically get a bucket that I can build up. Well, what I can now do is there's a bunch of new metrics available. And as we can kind of see, there's the regular metrics that we kind of always have. But now there's these bursting metrics. I can see, well, what can I burst up to? And for the OS and data disks, what's my target IOPS, what's my target bandwidth, and what are my credits left? So I can now go and get a whole bunch of information through the Azure Monitor metrics, that, those time series databases, to get insight into exactly, well, where am I around my kind of disk bursting? And Azure NetApp Files is moving to hard quotas. Today, I set kind of limits on volume and capacity, which really drives performance. But it's thinly provisioned. It's like 100 terabytes. Well, that breaks certain things. If I was to query how much space there is, I'll always see 100 terabytes. Um, it will just auto grow. So it makes it hard for me to control cost. Um, I could have some rogue process just go and use a bunch of space. So I'm actually now going to move on the 1st of April, uh, another April Fool's Day, to now those capacities I put in would be a hard limit. I can still manually change them, uh, but it won't be thinly provisioned anymore, um, and it won't auto grow. I will have full control of that. Uh, miscellaneous, uh, role-based access control for Azure Key Vault is GA. So if you remember, ordinarily, if I was to actually go and look at an Azure Key Vault, in the past, if I look at a Key Vault, what I actually get is I can set policies, but that policy is at the key vault level. So I could set an access policy, but I'm basically giving someone permission to all of the keys or all of the secrets or all of the certificates. If I want different people to have different access to different secrets within the same vault, I would have to create different vaults. With the new RBAC model, now, on a per key, a per secret level, I can actually go and set my own access controls. So now I can be far more granular. So here, for example, we can see, well, Clark Kent can read this particular secret too. Whereas if I look at secret one, well, that has a different access control. And in secret one, only Bruce Wayne can read it, not Clark Kent. So now I've got a lot more granularity um, on my key vault. So I can switch this R back. I can now use one key vault, but still have different people, different managed identities, having permissions to different individual secrets, not kind of all or nothing. And then finally, uh, US Gov Virginia now has availability zones in GA. So those distinct three AZs per subscription with independent power, uh, calling, uh, communications is now GA. And that's it. So it's actually pretty cool stuff this week. Um, I hope that was helpful. And as always, until next week, take care.